because Lord, that's what we've come to do here this morning. To praise your great name. To lift you higher and higher. And Lord, we thank you because we know you're here. As per your word, wherever two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, you're there in their midst. And Lord, everywhere you went, you did good. And so this morning, we know you're here to do us good. Be lifted, our Father, and be magnified in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Come on, celebrate the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Amen. As you descend to the comfort of your seats and celebrate this wonderful worship team. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Hallelujah. I want us to go straight to the word of God. Straight to the word of God in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 32 to 46. Hallelujah. First Samuel 17, verses 32 to 46. The Bible says, Master, said David, don't give up hope. I am ready to go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced. And he's been at this fighting business since before you were born. David said, I've been a shepherd tending sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. Tell your neighbor, lion or bear, it makes no difference. I killed it. I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God, who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear, will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul, Saul said, go and God help you. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. David tried to walk, but he could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. Again, tell your neighbor, I am not used to this. <laughs> and he took it all off. Mm -hmm. Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand, approached Goliath. As the Philistine paced back and forth, his shield bearer in front of him, he noticed David. He took one look on him and sneered, a mere youngster, apple cheeked and peach fuzzed. The Philistine ridiculed David. Am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? And he cast him by his gods. Come on, said the Philistine. I'll make roadkill of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a tasty morsel for the field mice. That's an insult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. David answered, you come at me with a sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. Mm -hmm. This very day, God is handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you, cut off your head, and serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine bodies to the crows and coyotes. The whole earth will know that there is an extraordinary God in Israel. Amen. We thank God so, so much. The Bible says, 
the lion and the bear, he killed them both. It didn't matter which one it was. And today, as we redeem the well of God's power, we want to see how can we become giant slayers. Born as a few. How can we become giant slayers? Now, the name Goliath, as it is written there, comes from a Hebrew root word, gala, which means to exile, to exile. And to be exiled is to be stripped of everything, stripped of everything. In other words, to have nothing. So the name Goliath means everything has been snatched from you. You are actually, as it were, empty. You do not have power. You do not have uh, any, any kind of armory. You are actually being striped of everything. And the Bible talks of, uh, even as we have read, and if you have time, just read the entire of chapter 17. This boy, uh, David, who was just a mere shepherd boy. In the Israelite tradition, this is what would happen. When a family got a child, that child would be the one whom, after they have grown, they would take care of the sheep. And when a second born came, the first born would leave the duties of taking care of the sheep so that the younger one takes care of the sheep. And I believe even in the Kenyan society that happens a lot. So at the end of the day, David was the eighth born uh, in the family of Jesse. And so all the other brothers, Kina Eliab, all those, had already had their turns in taking care of the sheep. And now him being the youngest, I want to believe that he took the longest time in the wilderness tending after the father's sheep. And you know, when you tend after the father's sheep, what would happen in Israel, you would not go and come back in the evening like the Kenyans do. In Kenya, you take the, the cows, the goats, and the sheep to the field, and once they have eaten, you take them to the river. If your place has a river, you take them to the river. Then in the evening, you go back home because there is a shelter that is prepared for them. Now, it was not so in the Israelite times. You would go to far places to take care of the sheep, just like the Masais do. And especially if you were a family that was ma mainly um, uh, what an animal-rearing family. And so David would most of the time take the sheep to the wilderness and maybe spend weeks out there. And you know, as he spent weeks out there, it meant he did not even have shelter. At times it would rain. And when it would rain, he had a coat that he would wear, a coat that was almost like a raincoat. When the rain would fall on the coat, it would slide off. It was like a warm coat for him. But you know, in a desert kind of a climate, the nights are very cold. And so he'd be out there in the night when the other older brothers were busy sleeping in warm places and busy being trained as soldiers. Now this was the boy, David. And as he continued being in the wilderness, there is this one thing that makes me very excited about David. He never came to a point of complaining, a point of murmuring, a point of whining because of the state that he found himself in. Instead, during those warm nights or cold nights and warm days, because at times the days would be really, really scorching. During those particular moments, he spent his time seeking after God. He had a flute that he carried with him and every shepherd had a flute because the animals were being soothed by the music from the flute. Just like in Kenya, you realize that all shepherds, whether they are ladies or they are men, somehow they know how to whistle. Am I right? They will know how to whistle because when they whistle, then the animals are able to be at attention to know the direction they are supposed to go. Now, in the Israelite history, what used to happen, they not only whistled, but every shepherd had a flute with him. David not only used that flute to get the attention of the sheep, but when the sheep were now relaxed, maybe they had eaten and they were lying down somewhere. If perchance there was a shed to lie down on, 
what David would do, he picked the flute and he started composing music to his father. And that made him a worshiper, made him have a very intimate relationship with the Lord God. And that's how come we have the book of Psalms that was written by David. He did not write it in the comfort of his bedroom. No, he wrote it when he was actually out there in the wilderness. No wonder he comes to Psalms 23 and he is saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. For you to understand the context he was writing on, it was because he was out there. He needed someone to shepherd him as he shepherded the sheep. So he comes and says, he leads me beside still waters. He was equating God to himself when he would take the sheep to water. And he goes ahead to say, he lays a five-course meal. If you read the book of uh, Psalms 23 in the message translation, maybe we can have it in the message translation. He lays before me a five-course meal. Let's read it. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. That is David in the wilderness. It is cold, but he's saying, God, my shepherd, I do not need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. Mm -hmm. True to your word, you let me catch a breath. And send me in the right direction. In other words, he has walked in the scorching heat. And then he is remembering God. Now that the sheep are lying down here, true to your word, you have just enabled me catch a breath. And there are times when in the hustle and bustle of our lives, you know, you wake up in the morning, things are very tough. The economy is just so harsh on you. There are times when we need to just sit back and say, oh, true to your word, God, you have made me catch a breath. When he enables you to pay the school fees, he enables you to have a meal on your table. Even when the dollar has hit 140 Kenya shillings, true to your word, Lord, you have made me catch a breath. And then the next verse in Psalms 23. Still, we are at Psalms 23. We are looking at this life of this man. Even when the way goes through the death valley, I am not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook crook makes me feel secure. In other words, it's like what we were be being taught yesterday. I am not afraid when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because the assignment you have for my life protects me. I am not about to die before I fulfill my assignment. Bonus if you you go like, mommy, uh -uh. I am not afraid because the assignment you have laid in my life will definitely make sure that I am protected because I am not about to exit the earth until my assignment is fulfilled. David knew that. Let's go on with that. Psalms 23. He knew that. He says, I am not afraid even if I am going through the valley. Verse 5. You serve me. Now, this is what I love. Bonus if you will. I love good food. Bonus if you will. <laughs> Amen. And the Bible says here, you serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. You can imagine a shepherd boy in the desert. It is hot. It is cold in the night. And he is saying, my cup brims with blessings. Now, this is a man who knew who he believed in. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I am back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. This is the man. He is in the wilderness. He has used his flute to compose worship to the king of kings. He is not busy complaining. Just like we are currently in the Kenyan economy. Things are very tough. Are you complaining or are you composing a worship to the king of kings? This was the boy David. He had developed a relationship with God that was so intimate. 
And now one day, the Bible talks of Samuel is sent by God to go and anoint David to become king. He, he's told to go to the house of Jesse and anoint a king for the Lord. And definitely as he goes to the house of Jesse, he finds these other young men, the brothers of David, who are very built. Maybe they used to go to the gym because they were also soldiers. They needed to look built so that they can scare the enemy. And Samuel comes and looks at Eliab and thinks, this must be he. And the Lord is like, no, it's not that one. The second one passes. No, it's not that one. Until the seventh one. And then uh, uh, Samuel is asking, Prophet Samuel is asking, are these all your sons? And the father goes like, there's one in the wilderness taking care of sheep. In other words, he was even forgotten. Maybe he had gone for so long until he was forgotten. The father forgot that there was another son that was in the wilderness. In other words, he was not worth being anointed to be king. There are times when our positions in our society, our gender in the society, or at times even our color in the society would make us not be thought of to be a people who can be anointed for greatness. But when the timing of the Lord comes into your life and already he knew, he, he already laid an assignment in your heart. He knew you were supposed to be the giant slayer. Irrespective of where you are, irrespective of your education status, irrespective of the tribe you come from, irrespective of the nation you come from, when the time has come, it has come. Bonus if you and so Samuel is telling Jesse, call him, and we are not going to sit down until he comes. Hallelujah. We won't sit down until he comes. Remember, we are slaying giants. We are digging the well of God's power. And so David appears, and he is anointed. But after anointing, he goes back to the wilderness. He goes back. He is still obedient. He is still willing to serve. He is still willing to stay in the place of prayer. He is still willing to stay in the place of worship. So he goes back. And I'm thinking if he had been a, a person in our current generation, anointed in front of the rest of the brothers, he would have told Eliab, now it's your turn. Well, as if you were, go to the wilderness. Haven't you seen the prophet has? anointed me king, I can't go take care of that sheep. But this man has a virtue that we can learn from. He was humble. He went back. He went back. So that was actually David's life. So one time he is sent into the field to check on the brothers who were in the battlefront and to take to them food. And as he goes there, he finds this Philistine, huge giant of a man. I'm told he was nine feet nine. That is way bigger than I am. You know? Maybe if we were to look for such a man, I'm just imagining crazy imagination. Maybe we would find him among the Dinka of Sudan. Maybe. Or maybe he was even way bigger than that. But David looks at this man, the way he is taunting the Israelites, the brothers uh, together with the other army men who are in the battlefront. As soon as Goliath appears, these people go into hiding. They are scampering for safety. But David looks at the man and is asking, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And I can imagine a small boy. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He had been in the place of worship long enough to know that God is way bigger than this uncircumcised Philistine. And no wonder he goes to Saul and he's telling Saul, your servant killed a lion. Your servant 
killed a bear. In other words, he had a track record of God's protection. He had a track record of God's divine enablement that gave him power to be able to slay a lion, gave him power to be able to slay a bear. And so he knew even Goliath will be one in the statistics. One as if he He looked at Goliath and remembered Goliath means what? Everything has been stripped and he is an exile. He has nothing. He is emptiness. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians chapter 2, if you can read verse 14 and 15, so that we know who our enemy is. This enemy that has been terrifying, as the Bible says, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. 15. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants. Who did that? Jesus did that at the cross of Calvary. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority. Tell your neighbor, sham authority. Even when they thought they had authority, it was a sham authority. Let's go on. At the cross and marched them naked through the streets. One is was a few. In the olden days, when kings went to war, if the, a king would be defeated, what would happen is that they would be stripped naked and the, the, the conqueror would get hold of him and walk him through his very own streets. Like, for instance, let me use an example. If Kenya was at war with Uganda, and then the Ugandan president has been defeated by Kenya, this is what President Ruto would do. He would take the president of Uganda, he would go into Uganda and walk President Museveni naked in the streets of Uganda. And that is what Jesus did with the devil. He stripped him of the sham authority. And so many times the things that stand in our way that make us feel like we are being defeated have already been stripped and they are in exile. Bona sifiwe. You come and you start crying that you know what? Things are not working in my place of work. All that you would know, you can stand in the place of authority. But it depends on your background. What have you been doing in the place of the wilderness? What have you been doing before this giant appeared? Have you killed a lion? Have you killed a bear? Do you know your God? Do you know your God? I loved it yesterday when our sister, DOI, those sisters who are here. Can I see which sisters who are here? Aha. Wale walikosa walikosa tu. You just missed. You need to know you have authority. But for you to have that authority, you must have developed it in the secret place. When David was killing the lion, there was nobody with a camera videotaking him killing a lion. There was nobody with a video camera taking him as he strangled a bear. It was in the secret place. So for you to appear in the cameras that you have defeated the enemy, the first thing you need to do behind the scenes, you must be ready to kill a lion and you must be ready to kill a bear. In the secret place, when things are very thick, when the, the, the landlord is threatening to come and close your door, that day you will not sleep, uh, you'll not sleep discouraged, you'll not sleep throwing a pity party, but you will go into the place of prayer, and instead of whining and complaining in the place of prayer, you'll go and tell God, you know, you are great. My house is being locked, but you are great. Mm? My children are back home. They are not having school fees for now. But you, Lord, are great and I know you are going to provide. My marriage seems not to be working right now. But Father, I know you are the one who is able to restore marriages and so I worship you. You must come to a point like David came when he is saying in the wilderness, things are difficult, but it's like the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. Let me say it in the version of a Sunday school kid. 
The Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. You must come to a point that you know that you know that you know that God is your shepherd. He will take you through in the name of the Lord. As I wind up, I don't know what we are going through today, but I want to give us some nuggets that can help us prepare to be giant slayers in the wilderness when we are in the wilderness. Number one, just because things are hard does not mean it is not God with you. Just because things are hard does not mean it is not God, or rather, does not mean God is not with you. God never promised it would be easy. He promised there will be victory. He did not say it will be easy, but he said one thing, there will be victory. And whenever you hear the word victory, you know there is a battle. Because how then can you shout and say, I am victorious over what? For, for someone to have victory, there has to be a battle. Many times when we are given the prophetic words and you are told, you will be victorious and you shout like, I receive. My brother, my sister, receive, but also prepare for, for war, for the battle. Because victory can only be received by people who are willing to fight a battle and conquer. So God never promised it would be easy, but he said there will be victory. And there are times when, wherever you are, the challenges you are going through are because you are destined for greatness. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wild or into the wilderness. Jesus, he has just come from the place where he's baptized. He has been told, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased then the Bible says in verse 1 of Luke chapter 4 that the Spirit led him to the wilderness. The Spirit led him to the wilderness. And when he got into the wilderness, having been led of the Spirit, just like David, Jesus decided to make use of this wilderness and he gets into a 40-day prayer and fasting. 40-day and night prayer and fasting. He takes that opportunity to commune with the Father. And it's my prayer that as we are seated here this morning, when the wilderness comes or when we are led into the wilderness, we will not start scattering by fire because some wilderness are not scatterable. Some wilderness are supposed to grow you and grow me. And so it's my prayer that you be able to hear God clearly to know which one you will scatter by fire and which one you will get into intimacy with the Lord God so that you are not mistaken. So Jesus decided he is going to pray and fast. And when you read verse 14, when he came from the wilderness, Luke chapter 4 verse 14, when he came from that wilderness, after the 40 days and 40 nights and being tempted by the devil during his stay there, the Bible says that Jesus returned to Galilee, powerful in the spirit. News that he was back spread through the countryside. There's a version that says, Jesus returned to Galilee, full of the spirit. Why was he full of the spirit? Because he used the wilderness experience to his advantage. When you go through the wilderness, do you come back full of the power of the Spirit? Or do you come back shattered and bitter? Number two. Preparation is vital if we are to enter into greatness. This part of the journey is solely our responsibility. You want to enter into greatness. You want to slay the giants that you will face. Then when you are in the wilderness, prepare adequately. Prepare adequately. It is in preparation that most of us are called, are called 
and chosen. It's in preparation. Most of us are looking for favor. We want to be noticed by someone and to be elevated, but we are not willing to put it into work. It will mean we throw laziness out of the door. And when I'm talking about laziness, I mean spiritual laziness. Because when you are in the wilderness, then that is the time that you'll be waking up early in the morning to seek after the Father. Hallelujah. That is the time. That is the time when you will be studying the word of God to know what it says concerning you. That time when you are in the wilderness and you are redigging the well of God's power, that is the time when you will become a worshiper. Your voice may not be found on the keyboard, but the Bible says in Psalms 150, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It may not be on the earthly keyboard, but in the heavenly keyboard, when you begin raising your voice and you begin worshiping during that time of trouble, God already recognizes it in his own keyboard in heaven. So preparation. Preparation is of utmost importance. And finally, preparation is what makes us worthy of greatness. It's what makes us worthy of greatness. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we should stay ready for we never know when God says to us, it is time for you to become great. You will never know when. And he has a habit of using those things that have been discarded. David was only bringing bread to the brothers. That's all he was bringing, bread to the brothers. But that became his turning point. Why? Because he had been prepared adequately in the wilderness. I don't know what wilderness you are going through right now. Remember a few years ago, we were taught, I think it's our bishop who taught us, that you're either in a storm or entering into a storm or coming out of a storm. How do you normally use your storm? Who do you normally talk to when the storm is raging? I want to bring it to you even as we come to a close. Maybe it is time to start engaging God in your storm. Have you been jobless for long? What have you been doing with the extra time because you're jobless? Maybe it's time to get your flute and start composing worship to the king of kings. Have you been waiting for a marriage partner for so long until you're almost thinking you want to help God find one? Maybe it's time for you to drop all your abilities of looking for one and start Getting prepared in the place of prayer. Maybe it's time now. Have you been having a child who is wayward? Being lost into the drugs? And you're wondering what to do? Could it be time for you to spend in the place of prayer? Could it be time that the Lord wants you to kill a lion and a bear? So that as you'll be facing the giant called drug addiction, you can command it and it gets out of your way. David had killed a lion and a bear in the wilderness. And he gets to a point where when they meet with Goliath, he realized this one is empty. Bure kabisa. And among Galia, he realizes there is nothing really. He only has empty threats. And so he tells this guy, you know what? You come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, you know? But today I am coming to you in the name of the Lord, the God of God's armies. And today I am not only going to kill you, but I'll also chop off your head. Hallelujah. As we rise up today, just be asking yourself, in this wilderness, how many lions have you killed?
You are desiring greatness, are you? But what are you doing in the wilderness? What are you doing in the wilderness? Because authority is developed in the wilderness. Power is developed in the wilderness. Greatness is developed in the wilderness. We see it with Jesus Christ. He is baptized and he is led into the wilderness. We see it in David of old. He is anointed, he goes back into the wilderness. We see it with Moses of old. He gets into the wilderness and it's while in the wilderness that he meets the Lord at the burning bush. Greatness is developed in the wilderness. I am yet to read in scripture where greatness was developed in a palace. There is nobody who was raised in a palace who became great without going through the wilderness. And it's my prayer this morning. It's my prayer this morning that God will strengthen us. That our hearts will not faint. Our hearts will not faint. And as I'm talking, yes, I know the challenges some of us are going through, but that our hearts will not faint. Just take a moment and tell the Lord, Lord, strengthen my heart in this wilderness. Tell him, Lord, help me to maximize the time in the wilderness. Help me to maximize this time in the wilderness, that I will be in the place of prayer, that I will be in the place of worship, That I'll be able to slay the lion. I'll be able to slay the bear. I'll be able to slay both of them. Oh yes. And even this giant that has been facing me. Will be just like one of them. In the name of Jesus. Come on just lift your voice. You know the wilderness that you are going through. You know that wilderness. I do not know. I can only know mine. I can only know mine. And in case you're here and you're feeling your heart is fainting, you could lift your hands and we pray together. You could just lift your hand, we pray together as we ask the Lord, strengthen our backs, Lord. Strengthen us, King in glory. Strengthen us in the place of prayer that we may not faint. Yes, we may not faint in the wilderness. We may not faint in the wilderness. Just lift your your hand if you want such a prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father. Father, we give you praise. Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you glory because of who you are, our Father. Oh, Jehovah God, we want to pray for these dear ones who are lifting their hands, our Father, and are going through wildernesses, oh God. We pray that, Jehovah God, you will strengthen them in the name of Jesus Christ, that, Lord, you'll help them to spend time with you, our Father, even though they are in the wilderness, like David did in Jesus' name. We pray that Jehovah God right in the wilderness You will train us, O God On how to slay lions, our Father You will train us, O God On how to slay bears, our Father That Jehovah God, when Goliath appears our way We will become the giant slayers In the name of Jesus Christ I know there are those of us, Lord Who are faced with various giants, our Father For some of us, it has been joblessness. For some of us, ends cannot meet. Jehovah God, for some of us, we are crying out for our children. Oh God Almighty, some of us, it's our marriages that are not working. Today, we want to take authority, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we want to address our situations in Jesus' name. We decree and declare that we are walking in victory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. For those marriages that are not working, we command them to align themselves to the word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh God, for those children that have gone haywire, your word tells us, oh God, in Psalms 112 verse 2, that the children of the righteous shall be great in the land. We decree and declare that our children will be great in the land. It does not matter how far they have drifted, oh God. We call them by name now. We call them by name, our Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Oh God, we want to thank you. 
because you are making room for us oh god you are making room for us to get jobs you are making room for us in the organizations you are making room for us in the companies in the mighty name of jesus christ father we thank you and we bless you name and maybe you are there and you're wondering how can i even be a giant slayer yet i do not have a relationship with the lord jesus Imagine the altar is open. You could just lift your hand where you are and we will pray for you. If you came this morning, you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus. It is his power that causes us to slay the giants. Are you there? Upstairs, are you there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful. We thank you, Lord, because you're going to cause us to move in your power, to move in your might, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Whoever has had their head drooping because of fatigue, our Father, fatigue in the spiritual realm, Father, I pray that you are the lifter of our heads. Lift their heads today, our Father, that, Lord, we may be able to move in victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive our praise, our God, and receive our glory this morning because we've prayed all this in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you.